Hello and welcome to the L31 Project. My name is Erica Smith and today we are presenting Beyond the CV, our look into the human experience of living beyond external accomplishments to acknowledge our true selves in our local and global communities. With us today, we have from Wisconsin University, uh, UV Bascom Professor of Law, Linda Green. Um, all the way from New Zealand, we have Angela Negro, a life coach who is carrying the message of hope through personal development far and wide. And we also have equipping students for today's fast-paced digital world. We have Tiffany Kim Colombier. And finally, we have Angela Shaw de Kock, who is from New York and from New York to Shanghai to Europe, lawyer and activist, as well as consultant here with us today. And so we're just gonna talk a, a little bit about um, some life experiences that you've had really beyond the CV, but we'll start with a really nice question for Linda. What brought you to pursue a BA in health education to law where you worked as a civil rights attorney on staff for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund in New York to becoming the first African-American to actually teach at Harvard Law School? Oh dear. <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. Well, I grew up at a time when people didn't say to little girls, you should be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so I actually wanted to be a teacher initially, a phys physical education teacher, and then a health education teacher. But along the way, uh, when I did get my BA in health education, I learned that there were many issues affecting African Americans in which lawyers had participated. So okay. I started to become aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I actually saw one female lawyer on television, uh, a woman named Faye Stender, okay. who worked to improve conditions in prisons. And she was my only visual Okay. of a woman lawyer in California. Of course, this is before 24-7, 365 television. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so the short story is that I became aware of the role of lawyers. Mm -hmm. When I applied to law school, I also applied to the School of Public Health at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I did, I was admitted to both, but could only choose one. And I, choose, I chose law because I thought that law would give me a chance to be a different person, not just a black and a woman, mm -hmm. but I would be able to assume the role of lawyer, okay. uh, which is a recognized role. Uh, as far as continuing my work, I was very fortunate to know a man named Derek Bell, okay. a professor at the Harvard University Law School, and also uh, my dean at the University of Oregon Law School, okay. And he actually advocated in favor of my appointment to Harvard, wow. along with many students and others who decided that it was time for Harvard okay. to include black women. So that's a short wow. story. There's a lot more in that. Yeah, but you can but, you can feel that there's actually more to that. You sure. Know, it's like, I don't know if we have time. Well, for of, course all of, that. Time. of course not. Of course not. A lot of people right. along the way right. played a role. So right. I was very fortunate. Okay, well, thank you. And um, Tiffany, how did you become interested in a technical field, eventually online web-based marketing, as a project manager, producer and consultant, and now equipping students with the tools they need in a fast-paced world of digital advertising, branding, and marketing from where you start as a major in art history and minor in philosophy? Good question. Um, I do think that um, being raised in America, I do think that no matter what type of uh, path that you take mm -hmm. in a in a university setting, you can always change your career. And I think that I've always had a certain propensity, perhaps because I am Asian, to be very, um, I, I wouldn't say that I'm very good at technology, but mm -hmm. it does come to me quite easily in terms of uh, adapting to it. And okay. I think that for, um, though I do enjoy, for example, I've always loved French philosophy, for example. Okay. Um, one of my favorite classes was Sartre, and, and he was always talking about, you know, how things revolved and the way things worked in terms of existentialism. And, and I think that um, what brings me here in France, for example, is of all the different reasons, but um, for me to be able to share my experiences because I worked in certain sectors okay. and because I have an appreciation towards 
um, creativity and um, and uh, technology. I think that it's 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 important that I be able to share that uh, mm -hmm. with the students. Right. Um, I'm not a professor like Linda, but I am pretty much a I would consider myself a freelance lecturer. Okay. Um, I don't talk about um, it's not so much theory as much as practicum. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so you're equipping the students still for exactly, right. uh, yeah, exactly, and and also to give a little bit of my um, my experience from New York, I think it it helps them to kind of look at things outside of their own little bubble that okay. they live in. So all right, okay, so I'm going to turn to Angela Shaw now, and um, so from New York to Shanghai to all of these beautiful places that you have gone. Um, how did you actually get into a law? Because that's something that I didn't mention earlier. You also were in law, but you were in entertainment law, if, as I remember. And um, broadcast law. And broadcasting as well. So. Because believe it or not, there was a time in the United States when um, there were very few um, black Americans that owned radio and television stations. Out mm -hmm. of 9,000 properties, AM, AM, FM, UHF, VHF, TV, black Americans owned 14 a.m. Mm -hmm. daytime only stations. And these stations are from the federal um, treasury. So it was a easily an affirmative action for white males mm -hmm. and the black American community, which is 10%, mm -hmm. should have had 700 as opposed to 14. So I came at that time that Nixon decided we need to do something about that. Okay. And so he hired um, Benjamin Hooks, who was a federal judge in Tennessee. He became the first black American to be an FCC commissioner. And Ben Hooks hired me as his lawyer. <laughs> so okay, yeah. I went out to um, Hollywood, uh, to the Screen Actors Guild, the Directors Guild, the Writers Guild, and read them the, the, the Riot Act <laughs> that okay. Nixon had put down that they have to include more black Americans and other visibly different ethnic groups in the gills. They couldn't mm -hmm. continue to be using an American resource, like the airwaves, mm -hmm. to the exclusion of so many others. Right. So um, that's how I happened to get into entertainment and broadcast law. Okay. Um, I'm from New York. I worked for Westinghouse Broadcasting when I was an undergrad. Um, won an Emmy <laughs> for, for, for uh, a radio program that I did for um, Westinghouse. Um, mm. But it was purely a shift in the national policy mm -hmm. from the president of the United mm -hmm. States. It right. just so happened that Richard Nixon was very pro-capitalism, mm -hmm. and he sort of wanted black capitalism Mm -hmm. to flourish. Right. And I was, it was just a t timing. I right. was there at the right time. The, the way I got to sh uh, China, living in China and living in um, Belgium and in France, was my, I married a Belgian who was working for a multinational ITT. Okay. And ITT um, at that time um, was you know, a very um, progressive, some might say imperialist company. Okay. <laughs> and so the companies moved us. So I wasn't a, a diplomatic um, expat mm -hmm. or um, a missionary mm -hmm. or um, a military. I was corporate. Right. And when I went abroad, it was before the internet. And the, you could be a corporate expat with your, it, you had more autonomy to right. be who you wanted to be at that time. Absolutely. Now, of course, you have all these influences. But when we went abroad, it was pretty much, you know, I, I controlled how our family would function mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in these different environments. A real brave new world. Right? Yeah, like the law and like the communications was, it was a brave new world. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And Ange, so um, from New Zealand to working with UNESCO in Paris to life coach in the southwest of France, where you conduct conferences and workshops on per personal and relational development, share with us your transition and how you came to be about yeah. here, you know? <laughs> I've sort of learned from all these experiences, including listening to yours, that life is just not linear, you know? It's mm -hmm. one of those things that I like to share with people in general. Um, 
And when I was in New Zealand, I really, um, during my undergrad degree, I realised that to help the world, which was something I had a sort of burning desire to do, we weren't going to help the world just by throwing money at it, but by teaching people to be who they were, use their own resources mm -hmm. and thrive in their own environments. Um, and so I started from that time thinking, I really want to work for UNESCO in mm -hmm. education, because I think educating is one of the best ways to improve you know, the world. And so I sent my CV out as much as I could and, of course, got lots of refusals mm -hmm. saying it was very nice, but you have no experience as happens. And I thought, OK, well, then I have to get to France. Okay. And within, I don't know, a couple of months, I'd found a job. Uh, I found a job with a company that took me to France um, a couple of years later. And I had this great experience of just meeting some people and within my first two weeks in France I just met someone who worked at UNESCO who I said well actually I'd really like to work there and she introduced me to her boss and then I started working for them <laughs> and so I was I loved it it was the most amazing work and I still think about it quite often but I was came to Toulouse as well following my husband and um, to get away from the city a bit and coming down here I thought okay so what can I do now mm. um, I, I don't want to leave the humanitarian area I want to keep helping people I want to keep helping people um, empower themselves actually uh, especially women uh, and girls because I really do think that that's our, mm. our future is mm -hmm. um, educating women and so I wrote up a program and I thought right I'm going to India and I'm going to set up a program and I was also using art uh, to help women um, understand themselves uh, work with positivity as well and optimism and I took the project to India and it was accepted and then when I came back I realized that my children were so small and it was going to be pretty hard to get there so asking my friends from UNESCO that I'd worked with all these years, I said, well, why don't you do it with people in Toulouse and maybe marginalised women, um, underprivileged women? And so I started setting that up and then speaking to people around me, it was like, mm -hmm. well, couldn't you do that with us? And that's yeah. it. That's what, that's what started everything. Got it going, yeah. That was the catalyst. Right. Yeah, that was it. It was just, and it's, and it's been a really organic process. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like it's something that's bigger than me. It's... Mm -hmm. It, 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 something else decides where it goes in a way right. and I do the research and the study and the put the effort in for it right. to happen so, yeah. I mean I think that happens to a lot of us throughout our careers or even you know just certain things that happen within our lives and so my that leads me actually to the next question what do you believe has been the most important turning point point in your lives and careers so I mean either one of you can actually pick that one up you know what has been Mine's, mine was going to India, I think. Okay. It was it was it was going there with a project. Okay. After um, after years of not so much not working because I kept working, but I was working from home on smaller projects, and right. I lost a lot of confidence in myself. Yeah, that can happen. And right. building it up and deciding that I would go there um, when the risk of failure was sort of like um, less painful than mm. the risk of not doing it. I thought I'll go and see what will happen. And when the people over there said, "This is really great. We need something like that," right. I was like, "Okay, this is this is." So that was that was my big thing. Then okay. I was like, "No, this is what I'm here for." Mm. I would say I think the idea of turning points. Um, one of the things I'm hearing is there have been several turning points in our lives, oh, yes. and I would Always. say that. Yeah. But I think in terms of the one that has most defined uh, my life in the second half of my life uh, would be a conversation I had with a fellow lawyer. Uh, civil rights lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York. Uh, he had just come back. His name is Drew Days. He eventually became the Solicitor General of the United States, but at that time he was one of my uh, fellow civil rights lawyers. He came back from a one-semester teaching stint at Temple University in mm -hmm. Philadelphia, and he was describing his experience. It's a time when there were very few of black professors outside of the historically black okay. schools. Okay. He described his experience and then he said, Linda, I think you would enjoy that okay. and you would be very good at it. Okay. So he, he, he shared that. Um, he put the idea in my head that mm -hmm. I would be a law professor. There were very two female law professors at my law school, and at that point, I didn't know a single black woman law professor. Wow, okay. But he, and then I followed up with other men I know who were in teaching, and they uh, encouraged me to pursue it at a time when it wasn't clear exactly where I would begin or where I would teach, okay. uh, but they 
did encourage me. So, uh, Mr. Cool. Drew Days, uh, still Thank a you. friend, <laughs> Thank you. encouraged me, and right. here I am okay. today. Right. F.U. Bascom Professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Plug it in, plug it in. <laughs> Magna, put the plug in, put the plug in. <laughs> Please do. Tiffany or Angela? Um, I, so it, mine's a little bit more non-professional, but I do think that when I lived in New York, um, one of the turning points for me was a failure of a relationship. Okay. Um, my divorce actually made me see something that I didn't want to face, which is, you know, you're, it's a failure of something, but um, it was my biggest failure at that moment. Mm. And I, 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 I actually, it gave me the opportunity to uh, look into myself think about what I really wanted um, to discover who who is Tiffany in, mm -hmm. in terms of um, professionally, personally, all those things. And I think that it um, it really made me uh, face a lot of things that I okay. didn't want to. And I do think as, for me, coming to France, for example, um, as an Asian American, it, it has a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, things to think about in terms of uh, who am I in terms of race? Who am I as a woman? Um, just really empowering my um, my will to do something mm -hmm. about my life. Right. So mm -hmm. that's that's, that's yeah. a turning point. Yeah. It is. It, it's a huge turning point. <laughs> Sharing it with you. Everyone's like, you were married before. Like, out no, of the this, box. this right. is what. The, but yeah. this is what this yeah. is. It's really going beyond the CV and really looking to that human experience and how it has really affected us. And others that are maybe watching or will be watching, you know, or listening sometime soon. So it's very important that we know. And so, Angela, your turning point, or, or well, you know, well, would you make uh, a comment? Tif yeah. Tiffany, I'd like to just sort of follow on what she's mm -hmm. um, mentioning about um, your own expectations of who mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. I was 37 when I moved abroad for the first time. All I right. mean, we'd always had a summer house in Belgium, but I had never actually lived 24-7, 365 days in another place until we went to Asia. And I found um, I had been, I, I joined a women's book group. In fact, it was started by Peggy McIntosh from Wellesley College. It was called The Seed Project. And one of the things was to keep, a, in addition to reading, was to keep a journal. Mm -hmm. And I could not write in the first person. And I had never realized. Okay. As a lawyer, of course, you're always writing the party of this part, and, the, and you don't have your own voice. And it took me till 37 to realize I had given my voice. I, I, I mm -hmm. had no voice mm -hmm. of my own. So here mm -hmm. I was, all the way in China, so far away from being a lawyer, a New York lawyer, okay. and I had to say, who am I? Mm. And then, to make matters even worse, um, my husband's job in the international corporate arena he was hardly ever home he was always traveling it's not doesn't go it's not less when you go abroad it's more when when uh, uh, the corporate job takes you abroad you travel and you work much more than you would if you were in the home office mm -hmm. so what happened was somebody had to if, be with our children we had three mm -hmm. children so I had to take again this the risk of becoming financially dependent mm. which my mother had my parents oh, my I think grandparents all of, all never, of our mothers you never <laughs> let your finances become dependent on a man mm. and for me it was then my fam i made a commitment not only in marriage but to to my children mm -hmm. and i was not going to break up my ch you know i wanted them to have an intact family right. and if it meant that i have to sacrifice not being financially Independent. Mm -hmm. Well, that was going to be that was the sacrifice. Be so yeah. I mean, and that was not. That's not. I'm saying this in like two seconds. That was really, really difficult. Right. <laughs> I think sometimes points, today yeah. it's even difficult. I'm always apologizing that I'm not. You know, I got that Harvard Law degree. I should be using it, and mm -hmm. I'm not really using it. You know, as much as it could be used. Right. You know, I, I I keep kicking myself about that, and I know that's you know what? that negativity is pointless. Right. It doesn't do it. You know, it's. Yeah. So, but uh, thank Ex you, Tiffany, for giving me permission. Accept that. Yeah. 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 Accept, put it out there. Accept yeah. that she has a three-year-old grandson <laughs> who speaks Ooh. fluent Lord Chinese. Chinese. There you go. So you've done some things. <laughs> right. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. We're thank all you. exactly where we're supposed to be. And even though sometimes we don't That's see amazing. it in the beginning... We are actually where we need to be. And there's just so many things and so many lives that we have touched that we don't even really realize 
I mean, thinking, Angela, okay, well, I have this Harvard Law degree I should be using, but you don't know how many people you have touched along the way, and then what our audience won't be able to see are your children. You have touched our lives in such amazing ways. I mean, with a son in London, a, you know, a daughter at MIT, and another son in Shanghai working for the... Inter there are just so many things that each one of us have done in the lives of others, whether we have children or we have nieces and nephews or whether we have colleagues, and all of our work does matter. And so that's what you know, the most important thing is here, which goes on to the next question, who has been like the most influential person in your lives? I mean, we have had influences without knowing, but who has been the most influential person in your lives, ladies? My mother and father. Okay. <laughs> it's so like, cliche. Check, I know. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, yes, and there are many other people. Right, but right. My mother and father. And in what way? Because like, well, we know that the classic ways my, of being supportive. My mother, and... my mother taught me okay. early on to read, uh, to do mathematics, uh, to play the piano, et cetera. She mm -hmm. made sure that I could do all those things before I entered school. Mm -hmm. And my father was uh, very interested in literature, history, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so he was responsible for the books I read as a young child, Richard Wright when I was six, wow. Bruce okay. Catton, other historians. Okay. Uh, so th that, that verbal, and intellectual environment mm -hmm. my mother and father provided uh, has launched me. I always joke that I didn't learn a single new thing until junior high school. <laughs> 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 From the time I went to school. Uh, and that was because of my parents. OK, mm -hmm. that's a wonderful thing. You know, mine Thank too. You. It was my mother and father. I wouldn't have met my husband had my father not given me a graduation present <laughs> from college to go to Portugal. It was, you know, my father then who had faith that his daughter could just go to Europe, <laughs> you know, and she'll be okay. And then when I said I wanted to marry this Belgian man, he said, well, it's your life. You go out and try. I mean, my parents never uh, said no. I mean, they, they always encouraged me to go even where they hadn't been. And my mm -hmm. parents went to historically black college because they couldn't go to integrated colleges. Right. So I was the first to have to, to do that. But my parents were always behind doing it, mm -hmm. and you know, tr and the urge to travel and to be confident anywhere on the planet comes from my parents. My, parents. my father had been an opera singer in Europe and in Asia, and okay. uh, why couldn't I go to Europe and Asia? It was just, yeah, my parents. <laughs> that was Boundless. the greatest influence. Right. Yeah, mine was my parents as well, and also my auntie. Okay, um, mm -hmm. but it was. Uh, yeah, because we changed, we moved countries already when I was, I was born in New Zealand and then we moved to Australia when I was 11. And that was the start of my parents saying, you can change anything in your life. Mm -hmm. You just have to have the willpower and the drive to do it and you will find a way. Um, and my dad had changed uh, um, metis, professions sort of. <laughs> a number of times. Um, my, neither of my parents actually finished school, but they okay. always told me that it was really important to get an education and pushed me um, because I, I could. And so when we moved to Australia, my dad had a completely different job and he went into sales and this was in the 1980s and I got this, the first book that he was reading on sales was I Dare You and Then Think and Grow Rich. So everything he had, he gave to me. And it was more the positivity in it and the, mm -hmm. the fact that we're responsible for our own lives. And then after a really catastrophic relationship, um, I moved to back to New Zealand to live with my auntie. And it was at that time that she, she just like looked after me. I was her goddaughter and she hadn't had any children. Mm -hmm. And she was similar to my parents and saying, well, you have everything it takes to just blossom now. And she also got me into this idea of the law of attraction and abundance okay. and meditation. So she was a really formative um, person who was really formative for me. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Tiffany? Uh, I'm going to have to say the same thing as well. Okay. Uh, Winning my parents. parents. Yeah. Got to say it. But I, I would say that it was more, um, for example, my mother has been always the big, my biggest fan. So it's just amazing that she's always said, you know, you can do whatever you want. And for my parents being immigrants, they mm -hmm. understand the, you know, my adaption toward in, in France, for example, has been difficult. And, you know, they've traveled quite often and took us away and, and we've been everywhere. So I think my dad, um, as, as a role model, he's given me a really strong work ethic. Um, and 
and I do believe that, you know, having these role models, I, I think that it has definitely shaped mm -hmm. who I am today. So no matter for the good and the bad, and, and I do think that they've been direct and indirect in terms of, you know, exposing me to different things. And as much as they may not appreciate that I'm living so far away because <laughs> they're just like, they want to see their grandkids. <laughs> right. But at the same time, it's, it's sort of like we totally understand why you're doing this. Right. And irrespective of where we are on the planet, our parents are always within us yeah. and they travel with us as we move through forward and through our lives, through our careers and even our relationships. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Can well, I go add ahead, something? Because I was ahead. just thinking of, about, yeah, about you, Angela, because my mum gave up a lot to make sure that um, while my dad was working, that there was always one of the parents at home. Mm -hmm. So she changed her whatever she was working on so that she would always be there, always be there when we were home from school, always be there to be at our school functions, mm -hmm. always be there to accompany us at anything we needed to be in. And I mean, I... I just have so much my love for my mum that she's completely inspired me to do that with my own kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, I gave up as well my job at UNESCO that I really loved and all of my ideas of sitting in, in grassroots organisations, knee deep in mud, teaching women while I had my children small mm -hmm. so that I could be there as a support for them too. And so, you know, yeah. mums are inspiring. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay, ladies. So what type of advice would you give to young women? Yeah. If I could, well, um, I think that one of the things that I've, and I think about my own self and I think about how I'm raising my own daughter. And one of the things that I do think is that as a woman of diversity, um, mm -hmm. especially living in a very, um, in a, in a community that's mostly French, mm -hmm. um, I do think that, uh, one of the things that I would love to, I, I want to share with my daughter as well as other young, um, girls is, accepting yourself because mm -hmm. um, I think that we're living in a, in a society now where everybody's going through all these different changes in terms of physically, aesthetically, how, mm -hmm. how, how we consider what beauty is because it's, it's, we talk about it so much about the beauty inside, but I don't think that, you know, it's not, what does that mean? And I think that so many of us um, forget like how to accept who we are, our, our, you know, our flaws and all, all the things that we are good or gifted or skilled at. And, and I think that those are things that we need to really work on and, and to, to really just say, you know what, I'm not perfect. And mm -hmm. I accept that. All right. And I can trust what I, and I can trust what's right inside me. Exactly. Because yeah, we're, we're different. Absolutely. Yeah. So if I've got these ideas about where I want to be and what I want to be doing, then I can listen to that voice. It's, it's not to le hasard, as they say yeah. in French. It's, it's not um, a fluke. So right. yeah. And to, uh, and with that is not to ask other people for other people's acceptance. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, to, it's to be, hang on, this is who I am and yeah. this is where I want to go. So f find a role model. If you've got something really burning that you want to do with your life and don't ask people around you who haven't tried it. Go mm -hmm. looking for role models who've already done it, who've failed at some things and they've learned from their experiences and they've moved ahead. So it's like, okay, I can learn from that person because failure is also part of life and not to take every setback seriously. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would say don't be afraid to embrace change. Don't be mm -hmm. afraid to seek change. Change is a basic law of our lives, of the universe. Mm -hmm. And our lives are always dynamic and they're always changing. And mm -hmm. so that's a fundamental. And I think when we embrace change or understand that change is very natural, we can see ourselves in new places, in Absolutely. new roles, with different people. Absolutely. Um, so that would be my basic okay. advice. All right, thank you. And Angela? Oh, <laughs> um, I have a daughter, you know, that's uh, doing her, finishing her PhD in biochemistry at MIT. But the thing that I, I would tell women in her generation, and perhaps even when she was younger, there is an element of discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not just... Uh, the fashionable thing to be this one day mm -hmm. and this the other day. There is some um, value in rigor, yeah. academic rigor, cognitive rigor. Um, and I, I, in, in my view, there's been too much emphasis on so many of the superficial mm -hmm. 
aspects mm-hmm. of what is life and what is a career and not um, deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would, my advice to young women would be to trust in that discipline okay. that gives you a quality of pedagogy yeah. and not, you know, just the quantitative things. Oh, it's fashionable to be Miley Cyrus or whatever. Right. Exactly. Beyonce, <laughs> Beyonce or whatever. The, you know, it, yeah. there is, my daughter <laughs> took Latin. Yeah. She, she studied German. Yeah. I mean, the, the, these discipline, this is worth something. Yeah, Absolutely. effort as well. Exactly. Yeah. But, I, but I, you know, so maybe that is not sexy, but <laughs> <laughs> German <laughs> and Latin mm-hmm. are necessary in, t- in terms of your being able to weed out the distractions, the things that really don't matter. You have to have focus. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So that probably sounds like a parent. But no, I'm, but that's so true. <laughs> focus. Yeah. focus is all that well, gets you to where you want to go. Focus well, and effort. And that's where all the value is. That's when you feel good and you feel strong as well. Well, life is life and success are about more than images. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking the part might be a small part, but it's only superficial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is. That is. And in a world that we find to be even more superficial, what helps to keep you all grounded? What keeps you grounded from day to day? My kids. Your kids. (laughs) (laughs) They bring me back to reality. No, my meditation practice. I've had a meditation practice for 20 years. And that really helps me when I've got a lot going on in my mind, which is even there might not be a lot going on during the day, but there can be a lot more going on in my mind to mm-hmm. just pull back and get some space and get to the essential of what's really important okay. and know where to focus and direct my energy mm-hmm. next. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I think that changes uh, at every stage of one's life. Uh, but for me, a constant has been physical exercise, mm-hmm running. Mm-hmm. I ran when I was in high school and college mm-hmm. in law school and uh, continue to exercise. I've right. diversified my exercise. Right. But for me, that's the time when I focus on uh, what I feel and think. It gives mm-hmm. me a chance to break away from everything else mm-hmm. and value myself, right. value time. Right. And I that's love to important. read. Exactly. Reading is really an important part of my okay. life as well. All right. Thank you. And Oh, okay. Um, I, I do both reading and meditation, and I've done it for 40 years. Uh, um, but I think also there's an, a spirituality in mm-hmm. um, what my, not only my parents, but my grandparents. Mm-hmm. I really had strong relationships with my grandparents, and they had very strong relationships with the church. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I have their community. Mm-hmm. I mean, my grandparents died maybe you know twenty years ago, but some of their friends are still there, and it's so much easier to communicate with them through scripture. Yes, yeah. that was their language. <laughs> yes. that was the language yes. when there was that time. Yes. and so um, I it, I can go back. My grandparents can live again yeah. mm-hmm. when I go into their vocabulary and yeah. their spiritual culture. Okay. It, and that, for me, is comforting. Yeah. Because <laughs> my grandparents were so comforting when I grew up. So oh, that's, that's beautiful. A, Faith <laughs> is the substance yeah. of things yeah. unseen yeah. and yeah. the evidence of things yeah. unheard. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Those old Bible verses. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right? Absolutely. That's something that keeps a lot mm-hmm. of different communities really grounded yeah. <laughs> and not putting themselves above. But there is the community that is with us. And that there's just something just a little bit above us that we can actually try to attain as well and look to. Well, I mean, ir- irrespective of the entity mm-hmm. or the spirit uh, that one people choose different mm-hmm. um, uh, places in which in in which to lodge mm-hmm. uh, one's spiritual life. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a spiritual life is extremely important. Mm-hmm. A spiritual wow. life, it because is. this temporal world is full of lots of ups and downs. I am um, uh, both uh, religious in a traditional way, but also mm-hmm. have followed the I Ching Good. for uh, 40 years, okay. and that has played a major role in my own life and Excellent. in my understanding of the world and in my decision-making at right. an important point. So I think the spiritual is very oh, important. keep you grounded as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Tiffany, where? I well, I, I have okay. to say that I agree with <laughs> everyone, but I also do think that, um, as you said, in terms of spirituality. I think that it's important that um, I try to find a purpose mm -hmm. that is beyond me, and mm -hmm. it's okay. sort of, um, you know, it's it, it is for my children, and it is for uh, my community, and it's it's for my family, it's for uh, everyone that I I do find something that I can focus on in terms of um, finding the challenge, finding um, something to better mm -hmm. the lives of others and and. and okay myself I guess All right. and so this goes on to our next question about the importance of community how important is does community play for um, youngsters that are coming up or for young people that are coming up now in a world that is so individualized as well how important does community play I mean of course we're coming from backgrounds where community was everything you could not move left or right <laughs> without the community being behind you watching you <laughs> making sure that you're making the right steps at the same time it encouraging you it takes a village and they were right there but, but you know more and more in a fragmented existence where people don't live in the same place where they were right. born it's probably more important to uh, find community or create community. Yes. Absolutely. That's what we're doing right yeah. now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's the whole idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm. But um, I think especially in light of uh, the events, recent events that we've just had, mm -hmm. I, I think that the more we can get into um, areas as well where there is a lot of isolation, um, kids who aren't educated or haven't had access to it for various reasons, um, to, it's really important now to go in there with a with this sense of community and educate, help, um, inspire, so that they're not prey to outside right. um, evil sort of influences. I mean, I don't like using that word, but there are just some people out there that want to do harm right exactly and mm -hmm. without that sense of community with a whole lot of people just floating around without it without a purpose mm -hmm. they're the they're the prey well mm -hmm. it's interesting that you bring that up in today <laughs> contemporary time big times because i was thinking in the times of my grandparents when they used to have um for black girls yeah. boarding schools now they're only like four or five left but yeah. back in the um late 1800s early 1900s there were hundreds of black boarding schools for girls because it was dangerous mm -hmm. for them to walk to school. White yeah. men would yeah. prey on these girls and attack them. So they built boarding schools where you could send your daughter, <coughs> daughters, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and they would be in this, on this boarding, on this campus. So you could have guards to protect them. That's how community was life and death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how you're bringing yeah, the, yeah. The, to this time, I was thinking of, there was no thought. Of course, yeah. if you wanted your daughter to, yeah. to succeed, you better have a community that had a boarding school somewhere so she could be safe going to school. It wasn't fashion. It wasn't, you yeah. know, like a, a Jewish, um, like a yeshiva where yeah. they were learning. No, it was to stay alive yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because white people would kill them. Mm -hmm. So, so you, that, yeah. you know, there was the impetus because our terrorism was in in our streets we, yeah, like all those running years around, ago. Running, running around a just It was all those issue. years. Yeah. I mean, for, for us, this is new, perhaps, in France. Yeah. But this was our story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know, and from a social evolution point of view, humans are not made to be on their own. No. I mean, that's that's the worst <laughs> thing that can happen to a human being, right? Right, right. back in right back in Paleolithic times, and when we're all wandering around the pompa, you, right. you didn't want to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same token, I also believe that prejudice comes from the lack of education and ignorance. And that is why that when we're living in a close society in terms of globalization, I think that the, the problem that we have today is because we're not, we're, we're, we're faced with so much, we're conflicted that we don't share the same ideas, we don't have the same ideology, uh, ideological um, senses, mm -hmm. we, don't, we're, we don't know, and therefore I think that this conflict creates this kind of environment. But um, for me, uh, living in France, for example, and being of Asian descent, I mean, I was born in Seoul, South Korea, but as a as an American, mm -hmm. people when I talk to people, they're like, "Well, you're from China, you know," and <laughs> and and I say when I say no, and there's more than China, they don't understand that, and right. they think that I have an accent when I speak in English, or I've had students actually tell me that my English was very good. 
<laughs> and I was like, thank you. <laughs> we, we you speak get, English we very get, well. You are very yeah. articulate. Exactly. Yeah, you're so articulate. Exactly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Do you know I got that too being a Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> With the, it's strange. And therefore, I think it's my, I feel that it's my responsibility to not educate, but to share and expose these mm-hmm. kinds of differences because you know I I am I am not a tiger mom I am not um, I am not gifted in in certain things I have the propensity for it okay but there you, know, you go yeah, yeah. yeah I got you <laughs> <laughs> all right I like karaoke <laughs> <laughs> I'm very good at it so do I <laughs> so do I <laughs> We've got to do this. Okay, so I know what the what place we might be going. To lunch, you know? so anyway. Okay, so what has been some of your greatest challenges, and how have you um, been able to overcome them? Now, this is kind of like a different mode of question, but yeah, you didn't give us that one. <laughs> it, was, it was at the top of the page. <laughs> And greatest well, challenge for, for me recently is this long distance grandparent. Oh, okay, that yeah. is a huge. I have to admit, <laughs> it is it is <laughs> quite a challenge. Um, the Skype and this um, <laughs> WhatsApp, these these so called oh, yes, devices. And, and in fact, um, a, a friend said they're now in American elementary schools, at least teaching the etiquette of SMS. I mean, as a oh, part of reading really? comprehension, mm-hmm. you're. <laughs> Six-year-old should know the etiquette of SMS. I mean, some of this stuff is just beyond. We were just, you know, in, in Tokyo for over um, the Christmas, uh, New Year's holiday, and we took my three-year-old grandson to this neighborhood with uh, Harajuku, Harajuku, which is mm-hmm. where the adults put themselves into fantasy attire of, of some kind of, mm-hmm. you know, um, image, a manga, an, uh, you know, animation. And these are adults walking around <laughs> like Peter Pan. Or, or you know, I mean, uh, it, it's, that's a very big challenge because I don't want to, he says, oh, it's old-fashioned grandma, we can't talk to her, she's old school. No, I have to be yeah. up there. I have to understand right. what is this right. new world that he's in, mm-hmm. you know, technically and intellectually, you know, okay. this imagination of manga, or whatever the oh, yeah, digital really is, yeah. Harajuku thing. I mean, I, I, so, so that, that, I hate to admit that, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh, it just, that it, it has been a challenge. I think for my parents, it was much easier. All they do is follow what their parents had done. Right. You know, it yeah. was, and we were right in they, uh, New York. My mother was born in New York. I was born in New York. Yeah. I mean, we were all in one, my grandson was born in Shanghai. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's a cha- the, like really, in, really, what would you call it? Not intense change, but just like radical change radical from change. everything. Yeah. Right, radical exactly. difference. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. My biggest challenge is actually, f- weirdly, because I had never thought of it like that, being away from my family. And mm-hmm. yet all I was brought up to do was be independent. My, m- my parents had pushed me out of the house, but they encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do with my life. And so I did and moved right over the other side of the world mm-hmm. into a whole environment like, you know, we all have with people that we just, you know, a culture we don't understand, a language that we have to learn. And at the same time, that's been the thing that, that challenges what's made me grow the most. Yeah. And I think what's helped with losing sort of my community that I had was creating a new Mm -hmm. one, but with what I had around me. So not rejecting the one that I went into, but adapting myself to it. And at the same time, bringing like what you were saying, bringing what we've got to bring into it to make a new one. Um, right. in a different way. And that's how you've been able to overcome yeah. that particular Yeah, understanding challenge, and yeah. loving the people I was there to be with, right. um, you know, that I'd moved into there. I've moved into a different country, so I wanted to find out about these people, find out about their culture. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's accepting and adopting that, but also saying, well, I'm not going to completely lose myself. Here's what I've got to offer. So how can we, how can we work it together? Work it together, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You can go first. Okay. <laughs> Tiffany? Okay. Um, <laughs> I would have to agree, uh, I feel the same way in terms of um, uh, coming into a new country uh, at my, when I moved to France, I guess I was 30, oh my gosh, 39, 39. Okay. so at 39 trying to reinvent myself, mm. um, that has been still and still is uh, an ongoing challenge because 
I, I feel I'm so encouraged by such strong, smart women. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to continue that, you know, message and let everybody else know. It's like, no matter who you are, what country you're from, it's like we are all part of the same um, community and we have to, you know, really support each other instead mm-hmm. of bringing ourselves down. And um, I do want to, I want to continue that. And I think it's it's something that really excites me. And, and I also see that, you know, finding reinventing myself in terms of work and, mm-hmm. and career it's it's not really a career now but something else and 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 I really enjoy like where that's leading me I, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know yet but, and that's how you've been and able that's the part that's future I don't right, know the future and that but that's how you've been able to overcome some of the challenges yeah. that you faced sure. thus far in your journey so yeah, yeah. and Linda well I think yourself? um challenge uh, for me at this stage is to decide what I'd like to do mm-hmm. for the next five to ten years. Yeah, that was going to be like I, the next question. I, I, um, change it. I'm go- going to be going to the Renaissance Weekend, which is a, a gathering of uh, intellectuals and activists all okay. over the United States. Uh, in fact, one of my former students is making the arrangements for me, oh. so I'm very excited. But as a part of it, you have to fill out a questionnaire in which you state what have been your prior goals and accomplishments Mm -hmm. and what are your current interests. And I just finished making the list just before I came. And I was thinking, so I've been a civil rights lawyer, I've been a law professor, I've been a counsel to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, I've been a counsel to a major city, Um, I've been involved in sports with the United States Olympic Committee. I've been involved in sports at the university, Mm -hmm. uh, been on television, radio, et cetera. So I'm thinking about all the things I've done. And I was looking at those things and talk and had to say, now, what are my current interests? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to think about what we have already accomplished. Because one of the things about being a woman is the sense often that you have to continue to prove that you mm-hmm. belong, yeah. mm-hmm. that you matter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, what I'm thinking is that a real challenge is really to accept what we have already accomplished. Mm-hmm. I mean, to really value it mm-hmm. and value what we've already done. And in deciding on what the next uh, series of goals will be to I'm, I want the challenge for me will be able to make that decision with an appreciation of what I've already uh, been able to do right. and that's a different state of mind it's um, probably is what you all get when you meditate that sense of what's well, existentialism that you <laughs> yeah. talked about but that sense that today right now I am fine mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily have to think about what my next step is every moment. Right. So I think for me, I translate that into um, really stopping for a moment to appreciate what I've already done, mm-hmm. but then also to determine what are the additional areas mm-hmm. in which I might need to grow. They might be very different mm-hmm. from what I focus on. Mm-hmm. I probably need to grow personally, and I probably need to grow Uh, with respect to my closest relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that might be a very different point, say, than I would have thought about at 40 years old. Mm. So, yeah, so just Mm. deciding on what to do next, but with an appreciation appreciation. of what I've already done. Right, and so Linda is actually leading into, (laughs) I believe, the last question for today. okay. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I was going to ask at first, you know, where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? But I'm going to kick it up a notch a little bit. What kind of legacy would you like to leave behind? I mean, some would like to leave behind something for their children that's material or, you know, what, what would you, what all of you would like to leave behind? What would you like to leave behind? I would really like to, within the next 10 years, and when I say I want to really inspire women mm-hmm. all over the world, but let's start with where, where I am and my immediate family, to actually... Um, consider a lot of the things that we've been talking about and to follow what they have inside them and Mm -hmm. to realise their accomplishments and to know that change is inevitable and that we should embrace it Mm -hmm. and and to and to know that their choices are are important and 
Um, so whether it be through working with me, seeing this video, uh, uh, this, this show, seeing, you know, um, creating communities, because that's what I'd really like to be doing, is yeah. creating bigger and bigger supportive communities. Um, that's the legacy I'd like to leave yeah. behind me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's that there is that there is hope and possibility, and that it takes discipline, mm -hmm. and that it takes responsibility, and that we have to look into ourselves and and allow what we have inside ourselves to grow mm -hmm. and nourish it and work at it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think some things that I I talk about with um, my students, and it was a discussion that I had actually with my husband and. One of the things he asked me was, "Well, what do you what do you love to do?" Mm -hmm. And I could not answer that question. I couldn't I couldn't say I love it. I like it. I like doing this. I like to cook sometimes. I like to um, you know do certain types of work and 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 write and and um, and express myself and things like that. But would I say that I love? And I think that one of the things that I would like to and this is in terms of um, because this doesn't answer your question, but I still think about like, what do I want to do when I grow up? Right. And I'm still, I, I do, I, I have not achieved that yet mm. at this point, but, um, I think that's the exciting part. And what I feel that I would like to leave is, um, trying to find that one thing that you love mm -hmm. and love to do and to kind of make that your goal. And, and I hope that if I could leave that for my children at least, mm -hmm. is to do what you love and, and embrace it, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's, I a, it's, that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking a legacy of empowerment, mm -hmm. empowering, uh, empowering other individuals, a legacy of opportunity. I've worked uh, for that, for others all of my life. And I would say inspiration. Yes. I would like people to say, uh, the Robert Covey thing is right, your epitaph, epitaph um, that I would like people to say, hey, she inspired me yeah. mm. to do something mm. I didn't think I could do. Right, right. So those would be some nice Yeah, like if nice she can things, do it, I can do nice, it. Nice, yeah. nice things to have people say about you. Yeah. you know? I'll have no, questions nice. for you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yes. I, I agree with what all uh, everything that's been said so far, but I kind of get, um, in, in my, at this point, I'd like to do something a little bit, um, probably um, more mundane, but uh, a little practical. I, I, again, as this long distance grandparent, I think <laughs> about storytelling time that I don't have. Mm -hmm. So if I can produce stories mm -hmm. of my own, yes. of the stories of my kid's life, not the story of Dr. Seuss's life, the story <laughs> of my kid that's real for them mm -hmm. in the world. That is something that I really would like to leave. Wow. I mean, I, I, um, I'm i gonna write my memoir, but you know, that's a different, you know, right. it's, it's prose, it's a narrative. The making stories, not necessarily um, animation, but real characters mm -hmm. and producing them, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it's for the attention span of a, six-year-old, you know, five or six-year-old. I think that, why should he be watching Dr. Sue, or, you know, or, or Sesame Street, or whatever the other little super why, or Iron Man. Right. Those are not, you know, I, I, I think I would be a kind of remiss if I didn't try to leave a stronger um, sense of storytelling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah. and the permanence of the story. Yeah. It's just as you were saying, because it's worth something. Mm -hmm. It was valuable. Our, our journey <laughs> from where valuable. we were yeah. to where we are, really. The stories about your grandparents <laughs> in yeah. the 19th century and your exactly. parents. Exactly. That story your really colleagues was, at Harvard and, was worth yeah. telling. Yeah. And your children, stories about mm -hmm. your children. Because ordinarily, you'll tell your grandchildren about the parent. You'll say, well, this is what they were like when they were young. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. That's fun. So, that would be great. <laughs> so yeah, I'd like to house that here in Toulouse, and yeah. that's because I like living right. here. <laughs> but um, but I'd like to do it perhaps up with the Chateau Milan, right. at the Josephine Baker Castle. That inspires me. Her rainbow tribe, her yeah. whole uh, the the, the um, her work in the resistance. Mm -hmm. I mean, not the bananas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. 
So in, in an environment like that, that was nurturing to one of the greatest black women expats yeah. the world has ever known. Okay. So I think that's an advantage of being where I am. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. you know, using the elements of where I am now. Right. Okay. All right. Wow. Well, I'd like to thank if there's nothing else, if you'd like to add something else, ladies or we're good, I think. Thank you for thank the you. opportunity. Thank you Eric. so much. Thank you, Eric. So we're going to thank Dr. Angela Shaw de Kock for being with us, as well as Angela Negro, <laughs> life coach, uh, <laughs> Professor Linda Green, and Stephanie Kim. And thank you so much.